the Surgeon General notes that social connection is as fundamental a human need and as essential to survival as food, water, and shelter. In the report, it outlines that all-cause mortality is increased by 26 and 29 percent for social isolation and loneliness. Being there for each other, connecting on a human level, is something that we do that no other fitness modality does. And this differentiates us, and it gives us a power to impact brain physiology in a way that no other fitness modality can. And what else do we do that nobody else does? We leverage community, which is potentially the most powerful lifestyle concept here, in a way that nobody else does. And we should be shouting that from the rooftops because people need this more now than ever. Constantly varied functional movements performed at high intensity across broad time and modal domains. A definition that has brought us all together today and has changed the lives of tens of thousands of individuals around the world on a regular basis. But did you know that potentially the most impactful component of CrossFit is not included in this definition? Community. Today, we are going to talk about the power of community on health. And while many of us may appreciate that community is integral to the CrossFit experience, we may not be as familiar with the scientific evidence that supports how valuable it truly is. We're going to look at this today through the eyes of three very special CrossFitters who happen to be dear friends of mine as well. And through this experience, I hope that we will be able to highlight why CrossFit will continue to be the preeminent model for the delivery of fitness around the world, but also how we can leverage the affiliate model to change how healthcare is delivered in the United States. This is Dylan. Dylan and his family love Disney World. And they go every year and they ride all of the rides and they hang out with the mascots and they take photographs with them. And after a recent trip, this was about three years ago, Dylan was looking through his photographs and he came to this one and he stopped. And he stopped because he realized if he didn't make any changes, he was not going to fit in next year's photograph with his daughter. <clears throat> Today in the United States, and pardon me, Dr. Lyon, if you're in here, I'm going to mention obesity. 70% <clears throat> of the population is overweight and or obese. By 2030, it will be one in two that are clinically obese. The United States spends approximately $147 billion in excess medical spending associated directly to obesity. Now, Dylan knew that he needed to make a change, but he didn't know what to do. And he happened to be speaking to a coworker who asked him if he had ever tried CrossFit. And Dylan had never heard of CrossFit before had no idea what it was about or what it stood for, um, but it certainly got him thinking. And that day, he was driving home, and he came to a four-way stop on his way back to his house. And he looked down to the right, and he saw a little sign, little metal poles like those political action signs, but it said, Dawson CrossFit. And there was an arrow pointing to the right. And he was sitting at the light, and instead of going straight through the intersection, Dylan decided to turn right. He went directly to the affiliate, he signed up, and the rest is truly history for Dylan. Pretty quickly, he made significant changes in his body composition and lifestyle, and certainly started drinking the Kool-Aid. This is Dylan today. Uh, Dylan is a coach at his affiliate, 
uh, at Dawson's Creek still, and would have given anything to be here with us today. But his affiliate is moving today, and he had promised that he would be there to help with the move. So he is watching via live stream right now, taking a break. Um, so we should give him a little shout out. Now, one of the things that Dylan brought up while we were talking about this is that he used to be a musician. And when he was in the music industry, he had a very tight sense of connection and community with his fellow musicians. And when he went into IT, he lost that. But CrossFit gave him back that sense of community, which was so vital for him in his health journey at establishing his new habits and having them be ingrained. So what do we know about the science when it comes to the impact of community on metabolic health? I think this is one of the more interesting studies and a great one to reference because it is so comprehensive, but I just love the definition that it gives for loneliness in regards to the impact on metabolic health, that it is an immunometabolic syndrome. And in this article, they mention the concept of the conserved transcriptional response to adversity. Essentially, what that means is that how you interact with community, or the lack thereof, influences your genetic expression to initiate an inflammatory cascade which drives metabolic dysfunction and disease. And this is why when we look at social isolation and loneliness, it is consistently correlated with higher rates of insulin resistance, poor body composition, hypertriglyceridemia, hyperlipidemia, and poor muscle tone, as Dr. Lyon mentioned earlier. The other really important thing to know about Dylan is that he speaks regularly about his journey in health, and he coaches at his affiliate. And one of the things I want everyone to take away from today is that it's not just about the changes that CrossFit brings to our lives or necessarily to the people that we may be coaching in our affiliates, but it's about the people that those individuals go on to touch in their lives that they bring into the fold. Dylan speaks regularly on podcasts talking about his journey, and people come up to him and reach out to him all the time specifically highlighting how important it is to have somebody that they can look to and say, if he did it, I can do it too. Now, when we met Dylan, he admitted, hit a bit of a wall with his body composition issues. This past year, he took his, let's see, one rep bench from 155 to 225. He took his thruster from 145 to 195. We watched him compete at Waza on a team event last year, and he competed as an individual for the first time this year. That's Dylan. This is Sarah. Sarah had a very, very hard upbringing. She was in foster care for the majority of it. Uh, she started using drugs at the age of 13 and in high school was introduced to opiates. <clears throat> Today in the United States, one in five individuals had a diagnosed substance use disorder last year. That's diagnosed. So you can multiply that by whatever number you want to. Of those individuals, approximately 50 million Americans, 93% got no form of treatment. 93%. As of May 2023, 112,000 people died of overdose over the past calendar year. That's over 300 a day. <clears throat> Sarah had highlighted to me that one of her darkest moments was when she was in recovery for substance use disorder, particularly for opiates, and was being prescribed Suboxone, and was living alone under a bridge, selling her Suboxone so that she would have food to eat 
and could buy meth and crack because if she was using that, she wasn't using heroin and she was winning. Now, as luck would have it, Sarah ended up in Portsmouth, Ohio. And there is a program in Portsmouth that integrates CrossFit with recovery. And this is spearheaded by the Portsmouth Kettlebell Club and the Counseling Center in Southern Ohio. Shortly after arriving, um, Sarah was able to wean off of her Suboxone and at this point has accumulated over five years clean, which is the longest stretch um, since she started. Now, University of Kentucky recently was in Portsmouth and did an analysis of the effectiveness of using fitness as a component of substance use disorder recovery. And what they did was use a validated research tool looking at a concept called recovery capital. And recovery capital essentially encompasses all of the interpersonal relationships, family connections, and community support that have been shown to translate directly into long-term recovery. When they looked at the program in Portsmouth, what they saw was that 77% of the individuals who had CrossFit integrated as part of their recovery program reported no loneliness or depression symptoms. That was compared to 48% who did not have CrossFit. In addition, 69% of the individuals who had CrossFit as part of their recovery program reported that life was fulfilling and worth living and challenging, which all of us in here know how important challenge is in our daily lives, without the use of drugs. And that was compared to 48% of the other individuals. Today, Sarah is the director for a nationwide logistics company. Her formal title is HBIC, that stands for head bitch in charge. <laughs> She has multiple employees below her who are also progressing through the recovery program in Portsmouth. In addition to that, she recently got her L1, and she now coaches the same classes at the recovery center that she progressed through years ago. Just as Dylan did for individuals struggling with obesity and metabolic dysfunction, Sarah is living proof for everyone that comes into this recovery program that if she can do it, there's a chance for me. Now, Sarah couldn't be here today because she's busy running Dale King's company for him. <laughs> but, but Dale King, the owner of Portsmouth Kettlebell Club and the founder of the Portsmouth Method, which created this program, is here today. I'd like him to stand up, get around the class. I'm bringing this to everyone's attention because if you're interested in doing this work and you're an affiliate and you need more information or guidance or support, please reach out to Dale. This is why we are here to cross-pollinate and connect. Please take advantage. Now, I need to put an asterisk on this because I'm gonna talk a little bit about the brain against my better judgment because I'm being followed today by a world-famous neuroscientist <laughs> and a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. So, I will be happy to answer questions from anyone except Dr. Tommy Wood and Dr. Chris Palmer after this presentation. But what do we know about the role of community in recovery? Well, what's fascinating is we know that fitness has been shown to be integral to the recovery process in regards to substance use disorder. And part of that is because when we use illicit substances, we get this supra physiologic release of dopamine, right? And eventually through that process, we essentially have to use just to be able to function and to feel normal. And that through fitness, we begin to establish new dopaminergic tracts, 
which allow us to bypass these dysfunctional supraphysiologic tracts that were established in a much more functional and resilient manner. Now, the great thing about exercise is it also causes the release of oxytocin, and there is some evidence indicating there may be an augmenting impact on oxytocin in regards to the impact of dopamine. Now, what differentiates CrossFit in this regard from other fitness modalities is do we know what else causes an increased release of oxytocin? Right? Connection with community, right? Gathering around the whiteboard, right? Fist bumping after the wad, right? Being there for each other, connecting on a human level is something that we do that no other fitness modality does. And this differentiates us and it gives us a power to impact brain physiology in a way that no other fitness modality can. Do we know what else increases oxytocin? Loud music? Everybody's got music in their box, right? Box dog, petting dogs and animals. I was, I was telling Dr. Wood this story the other day. We have a, a program for incarcerated youth that come through our affiliate um, for substance use disorder, and they come usually once a week, and I had my dog in there the other day, and we just got like three months ago, she's a rescue. And within about 30 seconds of coming in there, and these are tough kids, man, they got a hard shell. There were six kids lined up. Sir, can I pet your dog, can I pet your dog? Oh, it's been so long since I've seen a dog. One kid sat there for probably 15, 20 minutes, just playing with the dog. And I'm standing back there, right, thinking about this talk, and I'm literally seeing the dopamine and the oxytocin and the serotonin just oozing into his brain. This is very powerful stuff. This study is fascinating because look, using a rat model, they showed that rats that were socially isolated had a significantly higher ad libitum use of morphine compared to rats that were socialized. But what's amazing is when they socialize these rats for 60 minutes a day, anybody else know what lasts 60 minutes a day? <laughs> it completely ameliorated the increased morphine usage. Power of community. This is Troy. Troy graduated from high school in the spring of 2001. And on September 12th was the first individual of the state of Iowa to sign up for the, armor, uh, the Army after the attacks. Troy did his basic training at Fort Hood and subsequently got deployed to Iraq in 2003, I believe. Uh, about a month after being there, he saw seven of his friends killed. Over the course of the remainder of his tour, he saw six more friends die. He returned home with a purple heart and depression and PTSD and isolation and a sense of true loss about what to do next. <clears throat> Today in the United States, um, approximately 50 million individuals or one in five of us will struggle with a mental health disorder. Of those, roughly 53, 54% get some form of therapy. Troy returned home uh, in chronic pain and emotionally fragile uh, and used alcohol and opiates to cope. Uh, he worked for the sheriff's office for years and things went on like this for many years um, until in 2013, uh, Troy decided he'd had enough and uh, attempted to take his own life. He woke up to his five-year-old son 
beating on his chest. And his wife, who was three months pregnant at the time, by his side. Shortly after that, uh, his wife gave him an ultimatum and said, things need to change or I have to leave because you are literally killing yourself. As fate would have it, Troy's wife was a CrossFitter. And she had been going to CrossFit Waukee in Iowa for some time. And Troy started to go, and within a very short period of time, he had stopped drinking, and he stopped using opiates to cope with his chronic pain. Soon after that, he was going for two a days, and you literally could not pull him out of the place. Now, when he came back, he had gotten up to around 340 pounds. And shortly after joining CrossFit, he lost the majority of that. Um, and has accumulated, I believe, over eight, eight years clean and sober at this point. So what do we know about the impact of community on mental well-being and mental health and in specifically depression? This study is interesting because they looked at UK Biobank data, which is a huge database of individuals, over 100,000. And they used a technique called Mendelian randomization, which helps to try and identify not just correlation, but actual causality, right? So are these things truly connected? Does one actually cause another? And obviously, it's not perfect. This is a statistical tool. Um, but it does hope to give us some better sense of a true relationship that is causal. What's amazing about this is there were a number of things that were associated with decreased incidence of depression. But look at the signal associated with the frequency of combining in others and having community. I mean, it is astounding, hugely impactful and powerful. And as you'll see, being part of a gym or a sports club is high up on there as well. So Troy knew that it couldn't stop with him. And he knew that he needed to share this gift with other veterans. And so in 2018, he founded the nonprofit called ValorFit. And if you guys haven't heard of ValorFit, what they do is obtain grant funding for veterans in need, suffering from substance use disorder or mental health disorders, to pay full price for CrossFit memberships. To date, they have helped over 2,500 veterans, and they have a 100% success rate through orientation. <coughs> I want to highlight for you guys how important this work is. I was talking with Troy two days ago, and he told me that he was at a veteran's house who had been found in his car with the motor running and the garage door closed, only because his Marine buddies had called the police to do a welfare check on him because he was worried about him. Being Troy, he went over to that veteran's house immediately and he saw that he actually had a Valor Fit pamphlet sitting next to him. And he asked him, you know, why, why didn't you call? Why didn't you do anything? He's like, I was scared to ask for help. But that day, because Troy went there, he asked for help, right? And now that individual this week is being enrolled and is going to get introduced to the power of CrossFit in community, which hopefully will change his life. Um, Troy's here with us today with his wife, Tiffany. Troy, can you stand up for us for a moment? And Tiff, and Tiffany. <laughs> and Obviously, we want to acknowledge Troy, but I also bring him to your attention with a ValorFit t-shirt because if you need or are interested in providing the service in your affiliate or you want to work with Troy, please connect with him while he's here. Okay, we got to take advantage of being together in person. 
So why is it in a country that spends more money than any other industrialized nation, we have by far the worst health outcomes? The reason is, <laughs> I took this picture a couple months ago. I was driving, had to pull over and take it. The reason is, our system is not designed to progress based on your healthcare outcomes, right? It's based on generating money. And there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody has to make a living. But the way that money is made in our system today is through procedures and prescriptions and hospitalizations. You don't need any of those things if you're in the wellness to fitness side of the continuum. Now, how do we begin to change the tide against what seem to be insurmountable odds? I want you guys just to look at all of these photographs as I move through them and see if you can identify a common theme. Anybody? Yeah. But not just community, a specific size of community. So what's fascinating is, is that in this paper, by Kanazawa, and this was highlighted in Michael Easter's book, A Comfort Crisis. If you guys haven't read that, it should be required reading. Please get it. But what Kanazawa did was propose what's known as the Savannah Theory of Happiness. And essentially what this comprises is that from an evolutionary psychology standpoint, we are hardwired to be happiest in groups of roughly 150 to 200 people. So whether we're talking about Amish parishes, or Neolithic villages in Mesopotamia, or companies in World War II, or CrossFit affiliates, it's fascinating how we all seem to gravitate towards that number. And the reason is our brains are wired to be most functional and happy in that setting. And so what they did was an analysis assessing happiness in relationship to population density. And what they found was an inverse relationship that the people who were in more densely populated urban settings had a much lower happiness level, and they also responded in a much more aggressive and negative manner to stressful stimuli. Recently, the Surgeon General put out a comprehensive analysis of the impact of social isolation and loneliness on health in the United States. And I encourage all of you to take a look at this. It's very user-friendly for the layperson. It's 23 pages, and the numbers will shock you. And in the report, the Surgeon General notes that social connection is as fundamental a human need and as essential to survival as food, water, and shelter. Most of you have probably seen this slide, um, but I think it's a good one to show. In the report, it outlines that all-cause mortality is increased by 26 and 29% for social isolation and loneliness, respectively. I may have gotten those reversed, but those are the numbers. And cardiovascular disease and stroke are both increased by approximately 30%. And if you look at this graph, right, Lacking social connection is about as dangerous to your health as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. And obesity is farther down on the list. So I hope through this process, we've started to highlight how powerful a lifestyle concept intervention, the use of community is at healing individuals, if not one of the most powerful. This is a map of the United States showing the healthcare professional shortage areas, okay? These are locations where they have a low number of primary care physicians in relationship to the population. And as you can see, the areas where we have the lowest levels of physicians are the areas that have been some of the hardest hit by the obesity and the opioid pandemics. Now, even more concerning is that 
the individuals who are tasked with addressing these issues are primary care physicians, of one of which I am, have been told that our responsibility is to create a healthcare home, right? And the vision of a true healthcare home is one that allows us to participate in shared decision making and develop a relationship with our patients to address both acute issues and provide guidance for preventative care. The state of primary care today is a frightening prospect, my friends. So physicians are leaving the profession at alarming rates. Uh, most recently, the burnout rate ranges from anywhere to 50 to the upper 70s in percents. Uh, one in five primary care physicians say they will not be practicing uh, within the next two years. And this was obviously all exacerbated significantly by the stress induced uh, by the pandemic for the healthcare profession. What's more is that because our system is predicated on procedures and interventions and hospitalizations, there is no value placed on preventative counseling. And because the value is so low for that, primary care physicians are forced to see large numbers of individuals per day just to keep the lights on, right? So a typical day for a primary care doc looks like 20 plus people. I don't know about you, but trying to have a deep relationship with someone and truly understand where they're coming from and where we need to start and provide guidance and counseling cannot happen in a 10-minute visit. <clears throat> this is a map of CrossFit affiliates over a similar geographic distribution. We already have brick and mortar facilities in the exact locations that need us most. Our challenge now is to continue to develop strategies to bring those people who truly need it into the tent. And this is what my gym owner and colleague and I and others are doing. So we have integrated health clinics into our affiliates in Nashville and in Northeast Ohio. For us, this is the future of healthcare. Taking health back to where it is truly created, which is on the front lines, in the affiliate, powered by community. <laughs> The affiliate health home for us starts with CrossFit as a prescription. And for all of the reasons that we heard earlier with Dr. Lyon and Dr. Patrick, it is a wonderful, comprehensive strategy to address some of the biggest challenges that we face as a nation right now in regards to healthcare. I test VO2 maxes on every patient that comes into my practice, and I, I can recall one that has not been above average, high, or elite for their age group. One. Okay. Why is that? It's because foundationally we do high intensity interval work, right? It, we don't have a choice. That's part of what we do. We just talked about the importance of lean body mass and muscle specifically. We move, we push, we pull, we hinge heavy weight, right? And what else do we do that nobody else does? We leverage community, which is potentially the most powerful lifestyle concept here in a way that nobody else does. And we should be shouting that from the rooftops because people need this more now than ever. One of the biggest principles for us is returning healthcare <laughs> to the individual. It's about empowering the individual, individual to take back the reins of their healthcare journey. We are at a point now where we cannot continue to rely on a system that profits solely off of our shared disease and despair. And that's what we have. It is time for us 
to stop being passive consumers and observers of healthcare and become active participants in our healthcare journey. Okay, before I wrap up today, if you haven't listened to anything else that I've said, I want you to pay attention right now. So this is Alan. Okay. Alan, at the time, I believe, was 59. I met him six months ago. And he and I met at a CrossFit competition in the Midwest, a uh, real big one. He's from Canada, and he trained for months, and he came to this thing to win. And he traveled with his coach and showed up in Indiana and was getting after it. And heading into day two, uh, he was in first place or tied for first. And 20 seconds into his first event of the day, in the morning on Friday or Saturday, uh, he collapsed. And when I got to Allen, he was dead. Uh, he had a full cardiac arrest. And we were very fortunate that day because we had an AED in place. And as most CrossFit gyms do, we had individuals in either lane, one of who was an ERPA, another who was a nurse, and within five minutes, we had Alan back, and he was cussing at me, which he later apologized for. But he was like, what the fuck is going on? Where am I? So Alan spent four days in the hospital in Indiana before he went back to Canada. And he subsequently got a defibrillator placed and is back in his box smoking fools 40 years younger than him as usual. Uh, he coaches there as well. And what I think is really cool about the story is that when I asked him to send me kind of, you know, juicy pictures of him working out, preferably with his shirt off, you know, this is the one he sent me. <laughs> Which is just so apropos for this talk, man, because it is all about community, you know. When, it, when I ask him to send me pictures of what matters most to him in regards to CrossFit, it's a picture of him with his people. And the guy on the right is his coach. He was there when all that went down. So I have a call to action for everybody in here. Uh, and I need your help. And I truly hope that you will take advantage of this opportunity because it is one of the most CrossFit things I can ever think of. Because it's about extending and growing our communities at our individual affiliates. And it's about saving lives. Through this process with Alan, we developed a relationship with the Shocking Press Foundation. Here's the proposition. Every single person in this room, right now I want you to start thinking about it, can partner with a community group in need in your hometown. It can be anything. Be a church, be a youth group, be a soup kitchen, be your kid's sports team, it does not matter. All that matters is they don't have the financial means to purchase an AED for themselves. On June 1st, we will have the Restart the Heart campaign where all of us can host a short 45 minute training session for that community group and for our affiliate members to learn how to use an AED. After that, the community group gets a free AED. These are expensive pieces of equipment, okay? Usually 2,500 bucks. In addition, if your affiliate does not have an AED, which I hope it does, but if it doesn't, you can buy one for 900 bucks, okay? And this does lower your insurance rates and a lot of other things that are less important, but this is the proposition. Now I asked them, how many AEDs do you have? Because we have got a shitload of affiliates. <laughs> and they said, we have as many as you can take. I want to break the AED bank. <laughs> okay. Um, if you guys want more information on this, we have a, a link on our website just to connect you with the Shock and Compress Foundation so we can set it up and give you more details on it. So, in closing, when we think about the definition of CrossFit going forward, 
constantly varied functional movements performed at high intensity, leveraging community across broad time and modal domains. This is not to say that doing CrossFit in your gym or at your garage box or whatever it is when you're on vacation on the deck is not CrossFit. It is. But when we want to talk about CrossFit in its most beautiful form, and it's most powerful, it's doing fitness with friends. Thanks for your attention, everybody.